Hello, and welcome to Doylestown Historical Society's continuing program of video histories where we feature prominent individuals who have had an impact on Doylestown and beyond. Today's interviewee is Dr. Joshua Feldstein. At this time, Dr. Feldstein is 91 years old and has achieved iconic status due to his association with Delaware Valley College for over 70 years. After arriving in Doylestown in 1939, Dr. Feldstein, as a teenager, Dr. Feldstein became a student at Delaware Valley College, known as the Farm School at that time. He stayed on after graduation as an instructor and then a professor and then a dean of the college and eventually became the president of the college, a position that he held for some 16 years. He retired in 1987 and continues to live on the campus of the college with his wife, Miriam, his wife of some 68 years. Conducting the interview today is Walter Schmakanisch, who is a long-term friend of Dr. Feldstein. Like Dr. Feldstein, Walt Schmakanisch is a retired educator in the Central Bucks School District. He serves on many community service organization boards and, in fact, was inducted into the Central Bucks West Hall of Fame in the year 2010. Before we begin the interview today, I'd like to acknowledge the work of our videographers, David and Jean Lostin, who have volunteered their time and, and significant skills in helping to produce this video. And now, Dr. Joshua Feldstein. This morning, I'm Walt Smirkaj, and I'm going to be interviewing a man whose name is synonymous with Delaware Valley College. And it's an honor and a privilege to have him here with us and to say welcome to you, Dr. Joshua Felstein. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Dr. Felstein is a very unique individual in that most folks who are interviewed seem to have just one kind of focus. We're going to take a little different focus today because where Dr. Felstein has come from, where he has grown up, and what it is that brought him to America is extremely important to understanding how he was able to accomplish all those things when he got here. Dr. Feldstein, let's start with where you grew up and how you come to be here. Well, I was actually born in Minsk, which is now Belarus. Uh, of course, when I was born, I was under the, uh, under the Bolsheviks at that particular time. But the reason I was born in Minsk is because my parents met, even though they were born in Lithuania, only 80 miles apart and they've never known each other. They met each other actually in Switzerland, in Bern. And my mother was in the medical school at that particular time, and even though they were born in the same place in Lithuania, just miles apart or kilometers apart, they have not known each other. And they, and they fell in love, and my papa, after his postdoc, was offered a position in Warsaw. At that particular time, everything was under the Tsarist regime, obviously. And my mother only had about one semester to go to get a me her medical degree, but she went with him. They got married, went to Warsaw, and decided to have three children two years apart, which is rather extraordinary. And they were married in 1910. My older brother, may rest in peace, was born in 1911. My sister was born in 1913, and I was scheduled to be born in 1915. But World I began in 1914, and, uh, and that means that they had to move out of Warsaw so like all the other people, and move and move and move, and they, kept, uh, and they ended up in Minsk, which is now Belarus. And in Minsk, they, my papa organized a school, and they were there all the time under the Bolshevik Revolution, which, was, which happened in 1917, 1918. And then ultimately, when Lithuania became independent, in 1918, at that particular time, they decided it was getting time to have another, another child, and I was born in 1921 in Minsk. And how old does that make you now, doctor? It makes me right now a mature person of 91, nice. and in a couple of days I'll be 91 and a half. That's on, wonderful. On, on the 12th of October, I'll be 91 and a half. So I was born in Minsk, and just because of the fact 
that I was born in Minsk and had a, a visa from Belarus, the Soviet Union, enabled me in time to get an immigration visa to go to the United States of America. Okay, then let's go back. Let's go back to your father and the, the, the role that he played. He was an educated man. That's correct. Very well educated. And he made the decision that he was going to do something special with you. You were the youngest child. That's correct. And so he started a plan that was going to eventually lead you to be here in Doylestown. Part of the plan was that you were to go to America to hopefully a small college where you could assimilate into the American culture and get some education and, and then go back or stay here because one of your first goals was to possibly go into MIT. That's correct. And that was a goal that was set. But it was your father with his good planning that set the stage for you to eventually come to America. The fact that you were born in Minsk was a very important factor in your getting the visa. Tell us about that. That's correct, because, because the, see, to, to get an immigration visa to the United States, it was all based on a quota at that particular time. And the quota in the Soviet Union was empty, because no people could get out of there. And he, and he realized it. And he immediately was of the opinion, and he has checked into it whether I would be eligible to get not just a visitor's visa, but an immigration visa under the quota of the Soviet Union. All because you were born, born in, in Minsk. Minsk. That's correct. And, and so then the stage is set now. You are to come to America, you are to go to a small college and get assimilated into the American culture. However, there is going to be a problem now, as I look through your, your memoirs and realized that there was an encounter with the SS troops, the Nazis, because Adolf Hitler was rampaging through Europe, and coming and going was not a very easy thing, and there was an incident which, had it not worked out, you might not be here today. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. The only thing I'm, I want to just add and, and indicate that the intention was that I would stay in the United States, never to come back to Europe. Because at that particular time, in 1939, Hitler has already taken over Austria. Yes. He already took over the Sudetenland. He has already been moving into Memel. And the, and the borders were very tight. And, and uh, it was quite obvious. So in essence, it took extraordinary love on the part of my parents to actually decide to let their youngest son to emigrate when they must have known that they'll never, never see, see him you again. again. Yes. So yeah. when I got into Berlin, as you mentioned, all of a sudden this they is, told Excuse me, this is 1939. 1939. You I are left, how old? I was at that time just shy of 18. Okay. Because okay. I left on the 18th of March and I became 18, uh, 18 on the 12th of April. So when I came to Berlin, all of a sudden they've indicated that all the trains will not go anywhere. Yes. And I was right on the right on the railroad station, and all of a sudden two big assessment black shirts, you know, with two guns on each hip, uh, rather one gun on each hip, they came over to me and asked me who I was, and wanted to see my passport. Wanted actually to take my passport, but I wouldn't give it to them. And the thing that helped me at that particular time that I spoke German fluently. Yes. And I mean fluently, without any accent of any kind. And I just would not permit him to get that passport out of my hand. He had his passport over here, and I just held on to it, and I said, this is my passport. Mm. And I'm on the way to Paris. That I have to have an appointment over there, and I have the visa. I have an immigration visa to go to the United States. And he just looked at it. And he said, but, but there are no trains going anywhere, so he has to stay here. And that particular time, I saw people that were sitting on the benches, you know, we were just looking at this little brat, I guess. And I said, well, that's the end of him, you know, because he was arguing with the SS men. They were both on my sides, you know. Yes. Told people about 6223, yes. 63. Well, ultimately, I asked him, is there any way I can get out to Aachen and then to Belgium? They say, well, there is a cattle train, or just kind of train of some kind that's going to go, and uh, if you wish, you can get on it. 
So I grabbed my two suitcases, and actually I, I believe two or three at a time, and I jumped right on the train <laughs> immediately without even answering them. I just grabbed them, went right on the train, and it took off within about 10 minutes or so. And it took me to Aachen, which is right on the border of Belgium, where again they had looked at my passport, but that was just a formality. And, uh, and within a couple of minutes, I was in Belgium, and I knew that I was free. And, the, and, uh, at that, and when they were pondering whether yeah, or not to allow you, yes. that, was a, that was a changer. That was the that thing was a that changer. could have... There's no question about it. Right. If I had not spoken fluently, and if I had not... See, I'll be very honest with you. See, I don't know where I got all the guts. But I guess I had some guts as a young person. <laughs> yes, you maybe, did. Maybe, maybe that's why my parents wanted me out of there, because they probably <laughs> thought, who knows what I would do. You would, you would yes, yeah, you yeah. were ready to stand up yeah, if it was yeah. needed. Uh, I probably joined the partisans. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so then you went on to Le Havre, France, and you no, boarded no, no, the... No, from there, from there I went to Paris. Paris? Where, where my aunt and my cousins were in Paris, and, they, uh, and I was there uh, almost six days. And then I went to Le Havre and boarded the SS Normandy. And, and that was one of the big type of ships, the very big ships, part of the Cunard line. And my parents were rather well to do. And, they, and I had my own cabin. So I was quite comfortable there. Well, and then when you arrived in the United States, you went directly to Delaware Valley. When I came to the United States, I was met by a student of my father. Mr. Chase. Yes. No, no. no. Her name was Ruth Kaplan. Kaplan. Uh, and, uh, and, she, and she met me and took me to Brooklyn overnight to stay at their uncle's place. It was a very beautiful place overnight. And then she took me to the railroad station where I got the Baltimore, Ohio train to Jenkintown, and from Jenkintown, I changed over to the Reading Line, and from the Reading Line, I stopped at the Farm School, which had its own station, uh, part of the National Farm School. And so then you arrived here then in 19 March of 1939, and uh, you came in, and you intended to be at the school for a year, and then move on to MIT, uh, but then things were in turmoil over in Europe with your family, and you, you, and then you decided to stay at the farm school where you majored in horticulture, horticulture and then you continued, and then you joined the staff. Now, so you were a student at Delaware Valley. Well, it was actually the National Farm School. That's correct. And then you stayed there and graduated. That's correct. But when I came to the National Farm School, the first person I met was Herman Silverman. Silver. Tell right that. at the station. Uh, he was at that time a mail boy. He was taking care of the mail, and he happened to see him. Of course, I didn't uh, speak to f now, uh, now much let's, English. Let's pose a second. If you knew Herman Silverman as I did, and yes. you you and you also, he was a mail boy That's when correct. you got there. And That's just correct. to visualize yeah, that. Well, 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 he was a mail boy. He was, he was a student at a school at that time, and he was the mail boy, and he, he met the train wonderful. to pick up the mail. And uh, I met him, and, uh, and we kind of talked a little bit English because I'm, my English was not too fluent at the time. And he had just a little bag on his back, and I was carrying three big suitcases. He didn't help me to carry them all. You and the mail See, boy. I carried myself, and he just took me up uh, right up the hill. Uh, which was unpaved at that particular time, and uh, it was just amazing. And the first person I met at the school at that time was Dean Goodling, and then ultimately that's the way it was. So, so th this that's was the beginning. That was and my the beginning. intention was only to stay one year, as you mentioned, and then to go to MIT, because the sponsor of mine was a man by the name of Edward M. Chase. Chase. He was the president of the Anglo-American Bank in Manchester, New Hampshire, and a very good friend of my papa. I called him Papa, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and he promised me uh, that he would sponsor me, obviously, that he had to have a sponsor to, come, to get an immigration visa. They, 
you have to prove that you will not become a burden to the United States of America. Yes. So he paid for my education here, and then I, I intended to stay only one year. And the reason he suggested to my papa that I come here is to become Americanized. Because he was uh, under the impression that uh, while I was still young and had a wonderful education, uh, was already in, in the School of, of Engineering, and that uh, if I were to go to MIT instantly, I would speak every language but English. Uh -huh. See, I, I would speak like, because there were an awful lot of people from all over the world. Yes. And, he, and he suggested, since I'm still young, why not go just one year and become Americanized? And that's a wonderful school. He knew the farm school. And, uh, and that was the plan. However, uh, however the, the war broke out, as you know, on September the 1st of 1939, when I was here. And uh, after a very brief period of time, I've lost all contact with my parents. And unfortunately, Edward M. M. Chase passed away. And, uh, and his son-in-law, by the name of Miller, has indicated that while he will honor what he did at the National Farm School, he could not in any way help me to go to MIT. But, but was it Mr. Chase, what, didn't he help to pay your tuition? He paid my tuition at the National Farm School, yes. He paid my tuition at the National Farm School, and he intended to pay my whole tuition and the upkeep in MIT. Yes. Because I obviously didn't have any money of any kind. Well, then at this point, you joined the instructional <coughs> staff. You got a BS from the school. Then at that point, it became the National Agricultural College. And then you went on to Rutgers. That's correct. Now, what, what happened at Rutgers then? Well, uh, you see, well, while I was at a school at a National Farm School, they offered me a position after three years to become a so-called PG, postgraduate, yeah. which means that I also began to teach already. So I began to teach, in essence, in 1942, mm. uh, in March of 1942. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, as here, I became this, a, a staff member. And, and, and that you may be interested to know that I intended to get into the Army Air Force. At that time, it was the Army Air Force, not the Air Force. And actually speaking, I had all plans to go into it, but the president of the school, unbeholden, un, unbeknown to me, did, has, has appealed the case and indicated that I was very important to be there to teach and to help them. And they reclassified me to C2. So I stayed there already at the National Farm School as an a, assistant instructor. And then I went up the ladder to instructor, and uh, on and on I went to Rutgers. Well, but was, that was based upon the experience at Rutgers where you got a master's of science in horticulture. That's correct. And then you got your PhD in horticulture at Rutgers. Right. And then you came. Now, if I can, allow me to go through the process of how you come to be the president, because you worked your way to that. Because you were an instructor, then you became an assistant professor, an associate professor, chairman of the horticulture department, chairman of the plant science division, assistant associate dean, dean of the college. And then, in 1975, you were elected the college president, a position that you held until 1987, and then you retired, and then you I went came. back. Yes, I, became, I came <laughs> back on two separate occasions. Well, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is precisely what happened. Uh, let me just back up just one moment. The fact that I remained here in, in 1942 and did not go into the uh, Army Air Force mm -hmm. enabled me to meet my wife on June Miriam. The 28th, Miriam, on June 28th, <laughs> on a blind date. And, uh, and we have been, uh, and of course, we, uh, we became engaged a year afterwards, and then because our papa said, my daughter will not be a teenage bride. <laughs> and when papa spoke, that was it. Yes. We had to wait. And she, we, we became engaged when she was 19, got married when she was 20, and we've been married now uh, this December for 68 years. 68 eight years, years in December. December. 
And because of Rabbi. the fact that, uh, that I had a wonderful wife that was very, very loving and understanding and helpful, that enabled me to continue my education in Rutgers and get my master's degree on a part-time basis. Yes. Get my PhD degree on a part-time basis. At the same time, I was still teaching. I used to go over there in the mornings and then come back and teach in the afternoon and make up all the hours. And by the way, I did get my degree in horticulture, but also with two strong majors in plant physiology and soils. So my specialty are in all those areas. Now, the person that helped me to advance at the college is a man called James Work. Dr. Ah, yes. Work was the president of the college. And, uh, and, he, uh, and he became my mentor. I mean, he, he just sensed immediately there's something special, I guess, from his perspective in me. Oh, sure. And, uh, and, he, uh, and he has enabled me to go to, to Rutgers. And then ultimately, of course, as you just mentioned, that I was advanced and advanced. And I never applied for the position of president. Never applied, I want to repeat that, never applied personally. For, I was very, very happy to be dean of the college because that was a, a, a enormous, we've done tremendous thing, had a big pr a building process, improved academic programs. But, uh, but he decided and he asked uh, my secretary to submit an application. <laughs> I didn't know about it. Oh, I didn't, that's interesting. I, I didn't know it at all until they asked me to come for an interview. Wonderful. Well, now I'm, I'm looking at when you did become the president and while on your way there, all of these accomplishments, and allow me please to reference these, in addition to adding two academic majors, which was business and the computer informational system, and the college accreditation, which is a very big thing, Absolutely. and you were able to achieve that thing and, and get it going. And then that's followed by constructing the Student Center, uh, the Construction James Work Memorial Stadium, improve the computer facilities in the Feldman Building, the Gemmel Center of Animal Husbandry, uh, the equine facility, the laboratory and classroom space in the greenhouse, and renovations to the Almond Building. And then in addition to that, the James Work Gymnasium, James Work Hall renovations in the Centennial, and the Holy Greenhouse Complex and, this, and the Mandel Science Building, all of those. Now, that's an undertaking and that's I mean, an accomplishment. All the buildings that we have at the college at the present time, with the exception of the one which we are, are going to build, the Life Science <laughs> Building, has been built during that era. During that era. Right? I, mean, I, I'm, I mean, outside of some of the very, very old buildings like Siegel Hall, Allman Building and some others. All of the others that you just mentioned, including the uh, dining room, including the oh, I've gymnasium. Eaten That's very special. Uh, yes, <laughs> and the gymnasium and everything else was done at that time. Because I was his, uh, I was James Work, uh, she writer person, and, uh, and he depended on me, and I appealed to HUD, I appealed to HEW at that particular time. You see, all of this was available to us because we were accredited. Prior to being accredited as an institution, you couldn't get any, any federal aid of any kind. You could get some state aid on a very limited basis because we were obviously accredited by the state, by the, yes. by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but you couldn't get anything from the uh, other agencies. But once we got accredited, we jumped right at it and uh, see, I was the point, I was the person that did most of the work with HUD and HEW, how is uh, housing and urban development, HEW is health, education, and welfare. And, uh, and we got big grants in those days and very low interest loans, which, which enabled us to do all that. And we also introduced during that particular time also some majors in biology and then chemistry ultimately. And, uh, and we are where we are. So the college actually evolved from the National Farm School to the National Farm School and Junior College to the National Agricultural College in 1960, and then on to what it is today, the Delaware Valley College of Science and Agriculture. And well, when you consider all of that building, we have to get into expanding the land. 
the 10,000 acres. Tell us about that. How did you well, do that? Uh, well, we didn't have 10,000 acres. Uh, see, what we have done, and see, but, but there were many, many people way, way in the past, in early stages of the school, they were very, very kind during the Kraskov era. Uh, Kraskov is the person that has, uh, has organized the National Farm School in 1896, oh. and he died in 1923. And during his tenure, uh, uh, see, an awful lot of people have given land to the college. So the college had almost 1,000 acres at a time. Uh, people uh, like uh, Erlanger and uh, Max Schoenfeld and Hellman gave uh, gave land to the to the school to the national farm school as a gift and they were very clever because whenever there was any property that was either contiguous or adjacent to the school they would buy it yes and that's what they did that's how they did and they expanded that. so we had almost one one thousand acres and then that amount began to diminish because some of it has been taken under eminent domain to get a bypass, you know, which we have right now. And, and uh, some of the land has been also sold uh, to, uh, to the hospital. So if you look at what we have right now, the Dorestown Hospital, the Doyle Elementary School, the Lenape Middle School, whatever his, his name is right now, were all on the land that the college owned on the National I wasn't aware of that. But by Erlanger, given at that particular time. And then also some of the other land also. But afterwards, we began to replenish the land by getting some very significant gifts. Yes. Yeah. Well, do you have any unfinished work of any kind that you are thinking about becoming involved again, or has everything pretty much gone along to where you think you can contribute? Well, I am at the present time uh, President Emeritus of the college. Yes. And uh, it's a lifetime position. And you're on the trust uh, board of trustees? Oh, yes, I'm on the board of trustees. And, uh, and I would say this, that there's still much to be done. There's no question about it, because any institution today with all the problems that, that they have has to evolve. You cannot remain what it was. I mean, they, you have to introduce all yes. kind of courses. As an example, I don't want to kind of move my hands, but uh, today we have new industries. We have new demands. I mean, uh, they see the computer age. They see the high technology age. So obviously any in institution that wants to not only survive, but to thrive, it has to adjust to the times exactly and change and that's what we're doing right now so uh, i am i'm playing a part the best part i can uh, to answer your question uh, did i accomplish everything the answer is no uh, i've said often if there were a monument on my grave and there won't be there'll only be just a plain bronze plaque because that's what i wanted to, okay. to do in bucks county by the way yeah uh, um, but if there were one, this is what I said to my wife that I would have liked to have had on it. He was never sorry for anything he did. He was only sorry for the many things he couldn't do. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Well, along those same lines then, Doctor, if you were a young foreign boy of 18 <coughs> today, yeah. coming here, if you knew one like that from a foreign country today, 18, what advice would you give him? Well, the best advice I would give him is to get the best education he can. That's number one, to get the best education he can and to do everything he can to reach his highest potential, his or her highest potential, obviously. Uh, highest potential. Now, there are some that are very blessed and they can become A students. I mean, I happen to be a very good student, sure. and many will only end up as a C student or a B student. But that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But to reach their highest potential, and to become involved in the community, yes, and to be part of the community and to contribute to the community in every way they can, financially, with ideas, with work, you know, with uh, uh, being volunteers, and that's what I did. 
I, you're I still serve right now at the age of 91 on the Bucks County Agriculture Preservation Board. I still serve on the Bucks County Open Space Board. I'm the chairperson of the Dollar Town Township Open Space Board. And at my age, see, I don't drive in the evenings anymore, and I actually wanted to get off it. And they told me, you're not getting off anywhere. So I mean, we'll pick you up and take you to the meetings. <laughs> so whenever go. there's a meeting in the Dollarstown <laughs> Township, there's a car right outside, picks me up, and we go to the Shamini Manor, and that's where we meet. And, uh, and I do that. And by the way, those appointments uh, to the commissions, as I just said, are county appointments. Yes. This is appointed by the commissioners. And, uh, and, and, and I've been, I'm the only person that I know of that has been on both agricultural boards, which means the Open Space Board and Agricultural Preservation Board, at the same time from the very inception, from day one. Yes. Uh, the only one then. The others are either on the one or the other, but none of both. And uh, so they, I guess they like what I'm doing. Yes. Any final words? Well, uh, it's been my pleasure to be here, obviously, and it's always my pleasure to talk to you and to talk to the, to the historical society, obviously. And, uh, and uh, I want you to know that as long as I live, uh, I will be part of the community. Oh, and yes. as long as this computer works, <laughs> this is the best computer there is in the world, I will do something and I will help in every way because every person they ought to remember that they ought to remember that the, the, the three G's or the three W's. And it's give, get, or get out. And the three <laughs> W's is wisdom, work, and wealth. Wonderful. <laughs> and that's what everybody ought to do. And of course, to do things in an ethical and a moral manner and to set an example. And not just to be an icon or anything else, but to set a really good example for the uh, next generation that uh, we care for them and we want to help them. And obviously, I, I, I have to mention that to help the, our people who are in arms way, because when, when a country like ours has people kind of scattered all over the world, I mean, we wish them well and we want them to, to come back safe and sound yes. and be integrated back in the society, and we got to help them in every way possible. So once again, it's been my pleasure to be here, and if there are any questions that I did not answer, you can ask me again, and I'll be pleased well, that, to come it's back. It's been wonderful. We've covered a great deal of, of information here today, and I just would like to say to everyone, if you'd like to have the pleasure that I have just had of sitting with Dr. Felstein, if you'd like to meet Dr. Felstein, any of the home games, the home football <laughs> games that you can attend, come. Look at the 50-yard line, look at the first row, and you're going to find, with people surrounding him everywhere he goes, Dr. Felstein. That's where you can be guaranteed to see him. It's been I my not pleasure. I have one game, any home game, in 73 years. In 74 years, actually. So he's been there for 74 every, years. Every and, home game. And he'll no. be there when they're, they're home this weekend, I think. Yes. And it'll be a, it's always my pleasure to stop and say hello to him, as everyone does, because he's a, a gentleman to be admired. He is an example for all of us. Please take seriously what the doctor offered in advice today. Been a pleasure. My pleasure.